Yay, we're live. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sinan Du, and I am the lead of public education and outreach in the Department of Physics and Astronomy uh, at UC Riverside. Welcome to our first ever virtual viewing of the sun we have hosted. Uh, this is a project in collaboration with the UCLA Elfenton uh, in the Earth uh, Planetary and Space Sciences Department. So here is my co-host, Emmanuel. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Emmanuel Masongsong, and I'm from UCLA Department of Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences, also known as EPSS. And we study uh, the sun and the Earth and magnetism and how the two interact. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, so I know some of you in the audience may have stayed with us uh, through our virtual program for a while, and some of you may uh, checking us out for the first time. Well, in either case, we'll welcome you and are excited to see you here. Um, we hope you enjoy the show. So today with us are also our amazing volunteers who all have professional backgrounds in astronomy. They will be moderating the live chat on the right-hand side of the website page. Um, so to chat there, um, you simply need a YouTube account. So now I'm gonna let them to introduce themselves. Mike? Hey everyone, I'm Mike Hartinger. I'm a research scientist at Space Science Institute and UCLA. And I study uh, space weather in the near earth space environment. And I'm really excited to be here, thank you. Thanks Mike. Uh, what about you, Vic? Hi, uh, my name is Vic. I'm a UCLA grad student and I study magnetic explosions in the near earth space environment. Cool, thank you. Colin? Hello, I'm Colin. I'm a PhD student at UCLA studying space physics, like some of these other folks. Uh, I'm interested in how the motions of energetic charged particles are controlled by Earth's magnetic field. And I also like to build instruments for space missions. Very cool, thank you. Uh, next we have Franco. Hi there, my name is Franco Iglesias. I graduated from UCR back in 2020 in, with a bachelor's of physics and currently I'm doing my master's in physics at CSCOLA. Happy to be here. Thank you, Franco. And finally, we have Dave. Hey, everyone. My name is uh, Dave Malewski. I'm a PhD student in UCLA at, working for the Department of Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences. Um, I actually work part-time at JPL. I'm working as a scientist on the NEOWISE mission. And what NEOWISE does, it's actually studying um, the Earth in the infrared, looking for killer comets and asteroids that might pose a threat to the Earth. But my work is actually focusing on CO and CO2 rates on these comets, but I'm very happy to work with the sun and with uh, the interactions with the sun as we will be learning from this talk today. Great, thanks everyone. Um, so as you can see um, in the live chat box, we welcome all kinds of questions and also uh, encourage you to give out your comments um, and engage in discussions. Um, since we are expecting a relatively large group here today, uh, we kindly ask you to respect others and also uh, um, just to be respectful in the chat. So most of the questions will be answered um, as we go through by the uh, chat moderators that just introduce themselves. And we will also, uh, Emmanuel and I will also um, answer some of the questions as we go. So we would certainly love to collect your feedback on uh, our event today. And you, all of you will be receiving a survey in a couple of days, uh, basically to collect your feedback. So we would really appreciate it if you could uh, kindly take a few minutes to provide uh, feedback for us and help us improve. Um, okay, so without further ado, I know uh, a lot of you are now maybe outside um, trying to look at the sun um, with us. Um, but before you do that, um, I would like to point out that um, there are something that you probably should not do. So to start with, uh, I am going to give a few safety tips uh, for solar viewing in case you are out there and wonder what to do with the sun. Great. So uh, to start with, first and foremost important thing is never to directly look at the sun, never because the UV radiation from the sun will damage the retina in your eyes, even when you are just looking at the sun for a few seconds. And that could lead to permanent damage and even blindness um, afterwards. 
And some, sometimes you say, okay, well, I have a pair of sunglasses. I could just wear that. Well, they're also not enough to protect your eyes. Um, and one other tip is never, never try to directly look through um, a telescope, uh, a pair of binoculars or uh, a camera without any proper solar filters because these equipment will um, actually be uh, focusing the sunlight even at a much better capacity than your eyes. So they would intensify the sunlight and burn your eyes even, you know, make it worse. So what you can do though, is that you can use uh, uh, a pair of um, solar eclipse glasses. Uh, well, I know Dave is showing that, but uh, they can't really see it right now. Uh, Dave, you can show it later. Um, or looking through uh, the binoculars or uh, telescopes that are capped or uh, equipped with solar filters. So the solar filters are something like this. Um, it actually reduces all the incoming light um, in different colors. So basically protecting your eyes, uh, not receiving as much uh, sunlight as you would that would be damaging to um, your eyes. Um, and for the solar eclipse uh, glasses, you can get those uh, online and they are made with specific uh, films or uh, sometimes what we call the, the Walders glasses so that they are good enough to protect your eyes. But what if you do not have some of these equipment? Well, one solution is that you can just DIY your own pinhole camera. Well, to do that, you basically uh, need two ca cardboard, um, one on the top where you just put a pinhole in the middle and you have another cardboard or simply just a paper as your screen. Um, so for that, you project the sun's light through the pinhole and to directly look at the solar image on the paper. Alternatively, you could also use uh, your pair of binoculars if you already have that, um, cap one side and letting the sunlight to go through the other side of the binocular. So do not directly look through the binocular, but you can always see the sun's image on the screen. So the only safe way um, here to, to view the sun is either by projection or by uh, filtering, like using solar filters. So um, yeah, well, I hope you um, learned so something that would protect you from actually damaging your eyes. And now I'm gonna turn it to Emmanuel to actually show us uh, the live image of the sun. Okay, everyone. So hopefully you can see screen. So what we're looking at right now is a filtered white light image of the sun. And first thing you'll notice is that, hey, it's not yellow. And that's a really uh, common question. And to explain that, uh, we actually uh, have to explain how the filter works. So the filter um, for white light blocks all the wavelengths of, of visible light, uh, basically equally. Um, and it blocks about 99.9% .9 of them. So, uh, so that's what makes it safe is, is uh, re reducing that, that brightness. And so the reason that it's white here um, is that the sun is actually trend, uh, sending out light in all different wavelengths and they all sum together um, and they make white. Um, so when you kind of think of the sun or you see a sunset and it looks orangish or yellow, that's only because the, the atmosphere of the earth is actually scattering um, the uh, uh, blue light and it leaves the sort of red or orangish light in its place. So the sun appears to be yellow or, or kind of orangish, but in reality, it's actually white. And uh, to be uh, technical, um, the largest amount of energy in, uh, is in the green wavelength. So um, we can't really see that, but uh, to an instrument, a sensitive uh, camera, then it would be more greenish. So right now what we're looking at is the full disk um, and the first person to ever look at the sun um, with a protected uh, uh, telescope was Galileo Galilei in 1610. And he used this new invention, um, which people used to, to see long distances, but he decided to look at the heavens. And so the first thing he noticed 
uh, which we can see here. Let me uh, get it into view. If you look at uh, just to the right of center, there's a little black dot. So that's a sunspot, and I'll go into detail about what, what that is and how they form and what they do. But Galileo noticed right away um, when looking at the sun day by day that the sunspots moved from left to right across the image. And so he started to draw them. And he started a tradition that goes on till this day where people record the sunspots and how they change over time. And so that's really important because we later learned that sunspots are correlated with solar activity and solar eruptions. So he didn't know this at the time, but he took note and what he, he first discovered was that the sun um, rotates every 27 days because he saw the sunspots go around one side and come back again. So that led him to basically uh, conclude that the idea that the sun was the center of the solar system. So Nicholas Copernicus had suggested this, but a lot of people didn't believe him and they believed the earth was the center and that made more sense to them. But Galileo, when he saw this, um, was convinced. So, um, Another fun fact, um, the sun is about 110 Earths wide. So that little sunspot dot is basically about the size of our planet. Um, so that kind of blows, blows your mind. Um, and uh, a million Earths could fit inside of the sun. It's so big. Another interesting fact is that it's almost a perfect sphere. Earth is kind of squished um, in the north and south direction, whereas the sun is so close to being a sphere, it's only six miles difference um, in the, the width and height. So um, most of the, the light that we're seeing here is um, not like a light bulb. It's actually ionized gas or plasma, which is closer to uh, a fluorescent light bulb. Sorry if you can hear a dog barking in the background. I'm at, I'm at home. Um, but um, the, the light that's coming uh, off the sun is, is called plasma, um, or the, the energy coming off the sun is called plasma. And uh, we can only see it with uh, the special filters. And so different filters give us different uh, colors and different uh, temperatures, different uh, atoms. So it lets us know the structure of the sun. It lets us know the temperature. Um, and uh, plasma on Earth is something we don't experience hardly at all. But uh, plasma makes up 99% of the known universe. And the sun itself is made entirely of plasma and makes up 99.8% of the entire solar system. So plasma is actually the most common form of matter in the universe, and it just so happens on Earth. The only plasma we see is lightning, fluorescent light bulbs, um, and then technically fire is a plasma, but it's different than uh, what we'll see on the sun. So, so yeah. I'll turn it back over to Shannon and um, we'll revisit the uh, sun uh, in a different color later. Um, but one thing I'll, I'll note, uh, last thing I'll note is that the edge of the sun looks sharp here. But in reality, um, the sun actually projects all the way its atmosphere extends to the end of the solar system path way past Pluto. And the two Voyager probes um, have actually gone outside of the, the sun's atmosphere into interstellar space. Um, and the, the sun's atmosphere, um, we'll explain, is uh, called the solar wind, and it bathes all the planets and moons and has different effects on them. So back to you, Shannon. Great. Oh, thank you, Emmanuel. Um, that was really fun. And uh, well, since you mentioned that the, uh, the sun in white light has a very sharp edge, um, and now I would like to um, share my screen again and actually you know, just talk about that. Um, so one question I have for everyone um, who are listening to us is that, um, have you ever seen a solar eclipse? Anything, uh, partial, total, or annular? Um, if yes, when? Um, uh, did you take any pictures? And uh, what kind of experience did you have? So you can type that in the chat. Um, but if you haven't, that's completely fine because the next ones, the next ones are coming up in 2023 or 2024 um, in the United States. And you can see that um, in 2023, it's going to be annular and uh, for this path. And um, the next total solar eclipse would be uh, 2024. So they're really coming up and you can get uh, ready for them using the safety tips that, that we were just talking about. So the reason I wanted to talk about the solar eclipse 
is that, um, as Emmanuel said, um, in white light, you could see a very sharp edge of the sun, but the sun doesn't really just end there. And it was for the first time, uh, human beings got to know, wow, the sun actually extends beyond the visible edge during a solar eclipse. So this is uh, an image taken uh, during the solar eclipse uh, in 1999. It's, it's been a while, but you can see with all the visible part of the sun being blocked by the moon, um, you can see a lot of features that typically you would not. For example, this uh, red features right here, these are like filament-like, uh, they're actually solar prominences. Um, and we'll talk more about them later. And you would also see like uh, this extended, uh, very extensive hot gas, um, almost extending like out to space. And this is what we call the chronofilaments. And these are very hot and tenuous gas uh, that are made of hydrogen, but ionized hydrogen, meaning that the uh, temperature is too hot that the, the electron typically associated with the hydrogen atom is already stripped off. Okay, so uh, the sun doesn't actually end just at the edge and there's a lot more for us to discover. Um, so since next, um, the next light view will be looking at more solar features, um, now I would like to give a quick run through of uh, the solar structure so that we know where those features come from. So to start with, we have um, the, the core, uh, the convection zone and uh, subsurface flow. By the way, uh, this is a cross cut view of the sun. So this is like inside and this is outside of the sun. So the core is where the energy uh, is getting generated from the nuclear fusion. Um, so it's an essentially burning hydrogen um, and uh, fusing that into helium. And the convection zone and uh, the subsurface flow all together, they are helping with the transfer of energy and also light um, from in, inside, deep inside of the sun to the surface of the sun. Um, what we really consider as the solar atmosphere is photosphere, chromosphere, and corona. So photosphere is the uh, innermost layer of the um, solar atmosphere. And it literally means uh, the sphere of light because when we are actually looking um, at say the white light uh, image of the sun, when we're only viewing invisible light, this is the sphere that we're seeing. So one signature uh, feature of the photosphere is that there are sunspots that we, we could see and those are you know, darker spots um, with relatively lower temperature compared to um, the rest, um, the remaining part of the sun. Um, moving up, we have chromosphere. Um, and just uh, by its name, it means a sphere of color. So this sphere is typically not uh, seen like in regular circumstances because it's sim simply just outshine by the light of um, the sun. But as we said that we could actually see it during solar eclipses and these uh, rosy red filaments are the prominences that we previously also saw in the other picture, right? Um, so this sphere actually has a pretty uh, orangish red, sometimes like pinky color, um, and the solar prominences are uh, right here, um, generating from chromosphere. And finally, we have a uh, corona, uh, not the virus, but it simply just means uh, the crown. So that uh, makes the outermost layer of the solar um, atmosphere. And again, during a solar eclipse, we are able to see this uh, a tenuous gas extending way out to um, the space from the visible edge of the sun. So uh, in this layer, um, solar winds are generated and you could also see uh, corona loops, um, but typically we would not be able to see um, corona just by looking at the sun since the visible part of the sun would just outshine um, everything, outshine the 
the uh, corona and also chromosphere. So after talking about um, all those different layers, uh, the, um, the structure of the solar atmosphere, um, and now I wanted to point out that um, because the sun is emitting in all different colors or we say wavelengths, so we can actually see the sun using different colors or filters. Uh, for example, when we're looking at the sun uh, through visible light, uh, this is what we see. And we're seeing uh, mostly the photosphere. But if we're using uh, ultraviolet, we could also probe um, the chrom chromosphere. And now you can really see uh, the prominences popping up, not just uh, a very uh, rounding perfect edge as we would see in visible light. And of course, if we use different colors in ultraviolet light, we could even uh, probe different parts in corona. And as you can see from the left to right, it's actually getting more and more extended as we are probing towards, you know, um, uh, like higher and higher layers of corona. So there's not only just one way to look at the sun, there are multiple ways and we could uh, view the sun in multiple colors. So uh, one thing that I'm typically, I personally very interested in is uh, that NASA releases a collection of multicolor solar image and now they are made into stamps and available at USPS. So if you're a stamp uh, collector or you're simply just interested in sun or you know pretty images, um, you can get these stamps at USPS. Um, I'm certainly gonna go get some. These are just very cool and pretty to look at. Um, so just a quick recap of uh, what we were just seeing uh, in white light when Emmanuel was showing us. So the white light filter, um, it only reduces the intensity of the incoming sunlight, but it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really just focus on a specific uh, color or wavelengths. So it collects all colors of light. Uh, what we're seeing in white light is mainly the photosphere, and uh, we can also see sunspots there. Uh, but of course, this is not our, what our sun currently looks like. Um, in, the, in the white light that we just saw, um, they were a couple of uh, much smaller sunspots because the sun is not as active. And um, some may wonder, okay, what if we just keep zooming in and zooming in um, into the sun's surface, what would we see? Well, this is what you would see that these are actually um, cell-shaped, uh, you know, like almost like um, small shells, um, but they are actually changing over time. And you can build it, these cells, um, you can treat it as the bubbles uh, on top of the uh, a boiling water. So that's the way how the sun transform its, uh, energy from deep inside out to the surface just by I just want to add um, that each one of those is about the size of texas those bubbles great point thanks emmanuel yeah so uh by cycling uh the gas from deep down to the surface um that's how the sun actually gets the light and energy transferred out um so it's by cycling through and these are basically just the bubbles that we see on the surface and finally, this is uh, what we will be seeing uh, right afterwards uh, is the H alpha viewing of the sun. So H alpha, well, that sounds like a very tacky term, but it's really just looking at the sun uh, with a specific color. So because the sun is mainly made of hydrogen, like 71% by mass, that's why it, uh, a lot of the um, light emitted is from the hydrogen gas. So the H alpha filter um, only filters out the emission um, from hydrogen. And it's about, uh, it's at about uh, 650 nanometers. So we know that for visible light, uh, we can see from 300 to 700 nanometers. So three, uh, 650 nanometers, that's already closer to the orange-ish uh, red end. That's why we're seeing the sun's image, almost that color. And um, in this H alpha filter, 
uh, we are seeing the prominences and uh, it's also enhancing a lot of features in uh, chromosphere. So um, I guess I'll stop here and turn it to Emmanuel. Now we're gonna see what our sun looks like in this filter. Emmanuel, it's your turn. Sorry, I'm gonna share my screen. Sorry, there's a, someone started their instant. I'll try to talk loud over it. Okay. All right, so you guys can see there's a red disc on the screen. So this is what the sun looks like in hydrogen. So if you look real close, um, just off the center um, at about say nine o'clock, there is a sort of white blotch. Um, that's the, the location of the sunspot that we saw earlier. And we can see that there's some, let's see if I can add more detail. So I have a few adjustments I can make on the filter. Um, so this is uh, the, the color of hydrogen coming off the sun and that little white blotch is near where the sunspot is. Um, so there's different temperatures um, all over the surface. And if we move to the left at the say, eight o'clock position right on the edge of the sun, which is called the limb. You can see there's a tiny little blip and that's called a prominence. So on different days, there's different amounts of activity, um, but today the sun is a little bit quiet and I'll go into why that is. Um, but uh, can you guys, can you see the, the, the prominence, Shannon? Let me see if I can zoom in a little more. I can, I can see uh, maybe a little blip um, around uh, eight o'clock. Yeah, so it's, it's at the eight o'clock position. So that, that little uh, amount of plasma is hovering above the surface of the sun and it could potentially fly off, but it's actually pretty, uh, pretty small. So it's probably not gonna do anything, but I'll show you some pictures where the sun actually can have large amounts of plasma hovering over the surface. And if it's unstable enough, it can actually fly off and hit our planet. Oops. Navigate here. Um, see what other features we can see. Let's scroll around. Sorry about the noise. Um, so there's the prominence. I'm gonna move closer to the center, just Yeah, and Emmanuel, if I remember correctly, you are um, using your, your cell phone to, to image the sun, right? Yes, so this, there's different ways of getting an image out of the telescope. So the, the, the white light image, I used a, a DSLR camera. Um, so hopefully this is a better view now. Um, so you can actually see some of this texture on the surface of the sun. Darn it. It's annoying using my cell phone to do this. Um, but the, uh, the texture on the surface kind of looks like an orange peel. Okay, that should be a little bit better now. Um, so there's, uh, this texture is called a, a, a spicules. Um, they're little like tongues of, of hot plasma on the surface of the sun and each one is about the size of California. Um, so I don't know if you guys can see at about the 10 o'clock just above center, there's a white blotch. And then around nine o'clock, just to the left of center, there's another white blotch. So th that's where um, there's increased uh, magnetic activity. And so there's a, a hot plasma that's, that's uh, seething off the surface of the sun there that makes a distinct uh, indentation um, in the hydrogen uh, uh, light. So we can sometimes also see things that look like worms on the surface. Um, so that's plasma. Um, so instead of a, a prominence on the edge that looks like either a loop or uh, like a flame, if it's on the, the face of the sun, it looks more like a worm or kind of a like a sort of crawly uh, uh, sort of insect. Um, so at the bottom, maybe at around six o'clock, uh, 5.30, there's a darker blotch. So that's probably a small filament um, hovering of plasma hovering above the surface. So, um, so this red uh, color um, tells us that 
this this is where hydrogen is is located, which means it's all over the sun. But if we were to look at the sun through iron, you would see more uh, detail uh, of the, the plasma coming off the surface in giant uh, loops and um, uh, extending uh, far beyond the surface. Um, and so, yeah, depending on what atom we're trying to look at, we can see different amounts of detail. What else can we say? Um, the uh, uh, different uh, atomic signatures can also tell us about um, activity. So um, one particular wavelength lets us know about, uh, in x-rays, it lets us know about high energy emissions. Um, we can also see um, detail in the uh, sunspots, which we'll go uh, into. And um, even though uh, we can <clears throat> see an edge here, like I said before, the, the edge of the sun actually continues through the corona and into the uh, solar wind. So at the surface, um, the temperature is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. But above that, um, in the, in the, at the phot photosphere is about 10,000. And above that at around uh, 20 to 30,000 is the chromosphere. So that's what we're looking at now. So this layer is a lot hotter than the, the, the surface, which is the white light image we saw. And if we go a step further than that into the corona, it mysteriously gets way hotter, about 30,000 uh, uh, Fahrenheit. So imagine the difference uh, when you put your hand near, near a, a heater or something, and as you get farther away, it gets cooler. So on the sun, there's this mystery, and we're still trying to understand this. And so my colleagues uh, at UCLA and all over the world um, that study solar science, this is the big mystery, is why does the sun get hotter when you get away from the surface? And uh, we think- Sorry, Emmanuel, I think so we're only uh, seeing your, your cell phone screen, not oh, the- Oh, it switched, sorry. So yeah, as I was saying, the, the mystery is, is why it gets hotter farther, farther away. So I'll go into that now. Um, are there uh, any questions if anyone uh, wants to uh, take a break right now or? Yes, um, so there's one question uh, asking, uh, well, from a uh, board now <laughs> asking, <laughs> um, why is looking at the sun during a solar, solar eclipse worse than just any other day? Uh, reflection and making the intensity worse like a laser? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess the first thing I would think is that um, when you're staring at the, the, the sun um, during an eclipse, um, it's tempting to look um, because part of the sun is obscured. So maybe there's this assumption that some of the light is blocked and maybe it's not as bad. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's a, a mechanical reason why it's any worse than, than normal. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so either way, you would still need to use protection um, in either a solar filter or use a pinhole camera um, and it's still safe. So looking at the sun eclipse versus not, I don't, there's not much difference. Cool, well, thank you. Um, I guess that's it for now. Uh, should we just move on to talking about space weather and solar winds? Right, yeah, so let's discuss the significance of all of this. First thing I'll say is that the sun is constantly changing and there's not that much going on right now. There's one sunspot and a little bit of activity. Um, it's, it's a little bit hard to hear you. Sorry, I just Sorry. switched uh, back to my computer. Um, there's, there's not that much activity right now on the edge of the sun, um, but that's because the sun has seasons. So let me share my screen. Gotta love technology. Can you see my presentation? Yes, yes we can. Okay. So we already talked about this. Um, so here's an overview of some of the things that we saw. Um, so I added some more details. So the, little, the, the flame on the, on the edge was a, a prominence and sometimes we see filaments and then the spicules, like I mentioned, is just the surface uh, texture. Um, so all solar activity is called space weather because the sun impacts everything around it um, through the solar wind and through this, this plasma, uh, basically uh, heated gas or uh, ionized gas that travels out of the sun in all directions, bathing all the moons, planets, and comets, asteroids, space dust, everything in the solar system is, is uh, affected by solar wind. So in this image on the bottom left, we have the sun not to scale and you see the solar wind traveling through space and 
uh, at the top is Venus. Um, so Venus doesn't have a magnetic field, um, a force field around it. Um, and then Earth in the middle has a force field, um, which you can see is a detail on the right. And so that provides a protection from the solar wind. Um, and at the bottom, a uh, sneak preview is Mars, which doesn't have uh, a magnetic field either. And we'll talk about that. So as I mentioned, the sun is constantly changing. Um, and that's one of the exciting things about solar uh, astronomy is that you can look now and then look in 20 minutes and a filament can, can uh, erupt or you could see a prominence get larger and actually rising off the surface of the sun. Um, so the first person to notice how dynamic the sun was, was Galileo, as I mentioned. So 1612 at the bottom left, these are his actual drawings. So that's pretty incredible um, that he took such detailed uh, 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 descriptions and, and uh, 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 draw, draw, drawings of the, the sun surface itself. So as you can see, they rotate around the face of the sun from left to right. Um, so every 11 years, we go through a solar cycle. So at the bottom right, you'll see in 2009, it was pretty calm. There was not that much going on. This is the sun in iron, the color of iron. Uh, so you can see detail coming off the surface into the corona. And at the bottom right, um, the solar maximum uh, was around 2014. So that was about five years between minimum to maximum. So another five years would be 2019. So that's the latest period was a solar minimum. It just ended in 2019, 2020. So we're just starting a new solar cycle um, where we're going to start increasing the number of sunspots. So there's been a few this year um, and over time we'll be having a lot more. Um, so stay tuned for that. And so the last thing I'll say is this graph basically shows from 1600 all the way up to the present, how the solar cycle goes, the number of sunspots goes up and down. So uh, we've discovered that sunspots directly correlate with the amount of solar activity. So the sun is a giant magnet. So some of you, uh, or all of you should have learned that the earth is a magnet also. And if you take a compass, it points to the North Pole. Um, so the same as, same goes for the sun. If we have satellites in space with uh, a compass on them or a special magnetic field detector, um, in the center, uh, there's this bar magnet. And um, in a, a school, usually you'll see a picture of this or you'll do this where you put iron filings and the filings uh, form these loops between north and south. So the same thing happens with the earth. You've got loops going from south to north, north to south, and same on the sun. Um, so that's a very simplified uh, diagram. But in reality, the sun is a lot messier and the magnetic field gets twisted and is kinked and forms these loops all over the surface. And it's this twisting and turbulence and um, sort of uh, uh, strange uh, uh, formations that lead to uh, what we call solar eruptions. Um, so the magnetic loops um, that normally go out north and south can get twisted. And that's because this, the equator of the sun rotates about uh, three days faster than the rest of the sun. So it takes about 24 days for the center of the sun to rotate because it's basically a gas, uh, a plasma, whereas the poles rotate at about 27 uh, days. So over time, that causes the, the magnetic loops to become uh, twisted and that twisting concentrates the magnetism and that forms these loops on the surface. And where the loops break through the surface is where we have sunspots. So this was only discovered um, in the last, say, 50 years or so um, with advanced um, telescopes and having uh, uh, satellites to be able to, to study the sun in different wavelengths. Um, but the, uh, the premise is that just like magnets, sunspots usually occur in pairs. Um, so the sunspot we saw in white light earlier um, would have a pair, but it's probably very dim. So on the right, you can see an animation of the loops as they're coming off the sun. Sorry, uh, hit the wrong button. And at the bottom, that's what it would look like if there was a horseshoe magnet um, basically underneath the sunspots. Um, so here we have an animation um, showing, uh, this is also in iron, I believe. Um, it starts off with just the sunspot and then it fades uh, to show, uh, to go farther out from the sun to go through the, the corona, and then you can see the lines of magnetism that are spiraling out of this sunspot. On the right side, um, and there's the Earth to scale, so the sunspot that we saw earlier is about this size. That's a typical sunspot. Um, on the right side is what the magnetism, a column of magnetism, uh, these loop uh, uh, bundles of magnetism coming out the surface. So some people ask, is a, is a, a sunspot a hole? 
uh, or is it uh, empty? Um, and it's not. It's actually continuous with the rest of the surface of the sun. It's just cooler because the magnetic field is so strong, it actually blocks material from rising up, the hot material that comes from uh, lower layers. And so it looks darker only because it's cooler. So there's two types of solar explosions that can happen from sunspots. And the first is uh, a solar flare. So everyone that, that hears anything about solar activity or uh, hears something on the news, they usually talk about a solar flare. Um, there's also something called a CME, which is called a coronal mass ejection. So you'll see um, at the right, there's first it starts off a really hot, bright color, and then you see these clouds flying off the sun. So the first solar flares, these are intense bursts of full, wa full wavelength spectrum. Emmanuel, uh, I think your, your internet is down. Well, okay. Well, uh, while we're waiting for Emmanuel, um, maybe we can uh, answer some of the, the questions uh, from the chat. So uh, Gary HF asks, um, how do you know a filament is not just a prominence viewed edge on? So I can, I can take that. Um, well, um, I guess there are, there are different ways of uh, viewing it. So a filament, um, they might be uh, different sizes uh, compared to prominences, and they could actually be prominences viewed edge on, right, Emmanuel? Yes, that's correct. Um, so the, the filaments, they look uh, like uh, worms or blobs when you're, you're seeing them against the, the lighter color of the, the surface of the chromosphere. But yeah, when you see it on the edge, you can see that it's actually um, extending over the, the surface of the sun and see it in relief. Sorry about that, my laptop just restarted itself unpredictably. Yeah, uh, no worries. Um, so I guess for, for this one, um, you know, the, the filaments can, uh, if it's like extending really um, outside, like extending a lot into the space, then we know it's probably not a promises based on, you know, the characteristic uh, scales or sizes, but uh, you know, it could be. Um, could be an edge on the prominences. Um, and someone also was asking uh, what cell phone app you were using uh, to view the H alpha image of the sun. Um, I'm just using a standard Samsung, Samsung phone, so nothing, uh, nothing uh, fancy. Um, so I just use the app, uh, the camera app, and that's it. And so I uh, switched it to the pro mode so I could change the um, exposure um, because the red light is very dim. So I had to increase the exposure a little bit um, and then just zoomed in with my fingers. So yeah, you could do that with any uh, cell phone basically. I have a, a special mount, which I can uh, show that real quick. Uh, well, I guess I can't, can't share my cell phone screen, but, um, but anyway, it's, it's a cheap cell phone mount that you can get for, for uh, telescopes. Um, almost back up, sorry. Okay, uh, yeah, no problem. And uh, we can, um, I can also answer some of the questions in the chat right now. Um, so uh, we have uh, Matt Kelly asking what creates the earth uh, magnetic field and uh, why didn't Venus have one? Okay, so I can at least tell you um, what creates the earth magnetic field. Um, that's because our um, Earth has a iron core, but the iron is not completely solidified. So some of that is still liquid. Um, so the Earth also rotates or spins by itself. And when you have uh, like liquid metal spins, that creates a current, and that current basically generates the magnetic field uh, that now is protecting our um, our Earth from you know, all the impact from the solar wind and space, space weather disasters sometimes. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah, okay, so Emmanuel, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. All right, so back to where we left off. Um, so the solar flares are intense burst of, of full wavelength radiation. Um, so that's everything from X-rays to gamma rays, UV, infrared, and visible light. So it, it's a bright flash but it's all wavelengths. And this energy is so intense 
that can, it can actually um, disturb Earth's upper atmosphere and uh, block radio communications. So um, uh, during a, a hurricane in, in Houston a few years ago, um, the power was out and there's no telephones or cell phones and people are using radios, but there just happened to be a solar flare at the time. And so that added extra static and made communications difficult. Uh, airplanes can sometimes lose contact with the ground when they're flying from Europe to the United States because uh, solar flares can um, disrupt the upper ionosphere, which is how radio frequencies uh, bounce um, to get from one place to another. Um, so this energy only takes eight minutes. So if there's a flare, we can't really do much other than uh, hope that it doesn't hit us. Um, and uh, so the other uh, major impact is that flares can cause uh, electrical grid uh, uh, blackouts on the ground. Um, so when there's uh, intense radiation in space, um, that can create electrical currents and electrical currents in space can actually translate to the ground through this process called induction. And when that happens, uh, power lines can, can get overcharged and they can cause fires. So in 1921, a train station in New York actually caught on fire because of uh, what we later discovered was a solar storm uh, or a solar flare. And in 1859, the first big uh, known solar uh, eruption caused telegraph machines to start clicking on their own um, because they had long wires spread across the, the, the country. And so they picked up electricity from space and started clicking and they actually caught on fire too. So someone actually went to the hospital because they got burned from a solar storm, almost literally. So coronal mass ejections are, uh, can, can happen um, at the same time as flares. Um, so a flare is just the light, whereas the uh, CME is actually an explosion of plasma that shoots off the surface of the sun. So these are superheated clouds and they're, they erupt from unstable magnetic fields around sunspots. So when you have a lot of sunspots, there tend to be, uh, darn it, my uh, computer is not happy. Um, um, so, okay. So uh, should I, should I uh, start my um, wanna, screen? Yeah, do you have uh, the, the new presentation, Andy? Um, well, I can share the old one, okay. if that's okay. I mean, we're, we're going to wrap up soon. Uh, sure, also, sure. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so, so CMEs um, are, are and, and flares are two types of eruptions that can happen. Um, so when that material gets to Earth, uh, it actually can hit Earth's, uh, uh, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, when it gets to the Earth, Earth's magnetic field actually protects us. And some of that material can actually leak into the north and south poles, um, as you see here. And when it hits the upper atmosphere, it actually creates what we call the aurora or the northern lights. So you can go to the next slide. So I, I don't know if any of you have seen uh, the northern lights, but please put in the chat if you have and where you saw them. So most of the time, you can only see them from the very northern uh, uh, latitudes, like in Canada and northern Europe. But when there's a strong enough storm, um, the uh, radiation coming from space hits the upper atmosphere and it causes it to glow. And sometimes if the storm is strong enough, that glow can extend down uh, farther south. So this glow that you're seeing is actually the, the glow of oxygen glowing green. Sometimes nitrogen in the upper atmosphere can glow red or blue. Um, and so the light that you're seeing is the, the Earth's atmosphere itself glowing in response to energy from the sun, not the, the sun uh, solar plasma itself or the solar wind. So the sun is, or the, the earth is actually what's glowing in response. Next slide. So what happens if you don't have a protective magnetic field? Well, Mars is an example. Its core actually solidified, we think, and it lost its magnetic field billions of years ago. And the solar wind is constantly hitting it. And it actually uh, was discovered that the atmosphere of Mars was ripped away. So oxygen and water was torn out of Mars's atmosphere, and that's why it's, it's as cold and dry as it is right now. Next slide. So how do we, we protect ourselves? Uh, we have uh, uh, an agency that studies space weather and issues predictions, but they're still only about a little bit more than a flip of a coin. So if a giant CME was coming, uh, we would need to uh, have more satellites to understand how that energy coming from the sun is changing, because just because there's an eruption doesn't mean it's going to hit our planet. And even if it does hit our planet, it might be weak or it might be really strong. In uh, 20, uh, 2013, there was a pretty big 
storm that was the last big one in 1989 there was one that was really big and that actually knocked out power in canada in montreal um so if we don't uh, predict these then we could actually lose power and it could be up to 40 billion dollars a year or 40 40 billion dollars uh, from an event like this um, which was estimated uh, by researchers um, because you'd lose communications and then uh, global transport um, and, and electricity. So that's a very serious uh, hazard that we need to prepare for next. So to better understand and predict, we have to have satellites closer to the sun. So there's two called Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter. So from afar, we can see the eruptions, but we need to be closer up to see how those uh, plasma clouds change and how solar flares um, uh, basically uh, evolve uh, when the material flies off the sun. And um, that'll help us to better predict. Um, whether or not it's going to impact us. Next. Uh, you can skip this one. Oh, skip? Well, this is just a, a basically 3D view of the sun showing how the surface is separate from the corona. And so the corona actually gets hotter, and so Parker Solar Probe will sample the corona and try to understand why it gets hotter and solve that mystery. So to learn more about the sun, we have a website called Helio Viewer. And this lets, lets you use uh, different satellite images. And so you could look at the sun in different wavelengths, different colors, different uh, atomic uh, uh, spectra. And so you can look um, at the corona, you can look at uh, CMEs as they explode and you can generate videos. So it's fun to play with that. Next. And to learn more about space weather, you can go to uh, spaceweather.com. There's daily news and um, photos that people take of the aurora and the sun itself. And to learn more about space weather prediction, um, uh, there's a wonderful uh, a colleague of mine uh, named the, the Space Weather Woman. And so she'll issue forecasts of what to expect in the next week, if there's gonna be aurora or if there's extra sunspots, what they're gonna do. And she's a very experienced uh, space weather researcher. Um, you can also go to nasa.gov slash space weather. Next. And last is a plug for my team. Um, Colin uh, and uh, Fick uh, were, uh, are members of my group and we are part of a team that built a satellite um, that's about the size of a loaf of bread and it's called Elfin. So you can visit our website, elfin.igpp.ucla.edu and we'll put that in the comments um, to learn more about what, what, what we do and how we built it. But basically it involved 250 students over five years and we study these particles that come from the, from the sun and how they fuel the aurora and how they can uh, impact our spacecraft um, and satellites. So um, this was built by college students. So you can actually potentially build a satellite um, in college now because these are cheap and uh, small and uh, can be built quickly. So thank you very much. We'll open up for questions now. Great, uh, thank you, Emmanuel. So I guess, uh, well, if you have your laptop or um, cell phone up, if we could put up still a live view of the the sun and while we're answering those questions, that would be great. Sure. Working on that. Um, at, this, at the same time, I am going to, um, uh, and well, at least recite some of these questions. So V. Cop asked, uh, what creates magnetic fields? Um, well, I'm hoping that I was able to answer this already. Um, so what creates it? Um, and I believe that's for all kinds of, uh, planets is that if you have, well, if the planet has a liquid core um, and that is a liquid metal core. So when it spins enough, um, it will actually has a current um, generated. So the magnetic field comes from this uh, current. For example, Mars, uh, it used to, we believe that it used to have a magnetic field, but now it's not. It's because Mars is much smaller than the Earth. So uh, the heat is getting uh, dissipated at a much faster rate. So because it's losing all its internal heat, the core can no longer stay liquid. So it just solidifies. And once that solidifies, no matter how fast uh, Mars is spinning, it would not generate that current. Um, and that's why Mars just gradually loses its magnetic field. And the solar wind, when solar wind uh, comes, there's no shield of its atmosphere. So the atmosphere just all gets stripped off. And uh, that also partially 
um, results in why Mars is now a very cold and dry place, just because it does not have the atmosphere to regulate its climate and also, you know, to act as a blanket to, to keep the, the temperature. Um, great question. So uh, the next one, um, uh, Janissa uh, Stanek asked, CMEs can cause cancers. Oh, can CMEs cause cancer in astronauts? Can it go through spacecraft walls or is it uh, if they are doing spacewalk during a CME? So Emmanuel, yeah. I'll, I'll sure. give that to you. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly um, what we need to worry about. And as we talk about having more people go to space as space tourists, I mean, I would love to go um, or putting people on the moon or on Mars, the moon passes outside of Earth's magnetic field. And so yes, uh, particles, the super, super heated um, fast particles coming from the sun um, can actually pass through spacecraft walls. Um, and we have special shielding that we can build um, but that has to be fully studied because we, we haven't had people in space outside of Earth's magnetic field before, other than uh, when, when the astronauts of Apollo went to the moon, um, they actually were inside Earth's uh, magnetic bubble. And it just so happened between Apollo 16 and 17, there was a giant CME that had the astronauts been on, on the moon, they might've been injured or even killed. So, um, so yes, it is very important to study CMEs and how they affect humans. Um, and uh, if, before we put people on Mars, especially. Thank you. Um, and we have another question uh, coming from uh, Letho Bizzle uh, asking, could solar flares be utilized as a source of energy? Wow, great question. Not directly, but there is, uh, because they, they happen so sporadically, um, we can't really count on them. And they're such large amounts of energy that they would actually damage any of the technology we have now to try and capture that. But there is an interesting experiment that the space shuttle did where they, they strung a long wire behind the, 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 the shuttle to try and pick up electricity that's just outside of Earth's uh, um, atmosphere in the mag magnetic field. And so they actually picked up so much electricity that it, it burst the wire and it, it like broke off. So there is a ton of ambient um, charge around the Earth that we could harvest it. The problem is how to store it and how to send it to the ground. Um, so you could use microwaves, um, but then you'd have to watch out for burning through things. Um, but yes, that is a, an interesting question. There is tons of, of electrical energy outside the planet that you wouldn't need solar cells to harvest. Great, thank you very much. Um, and you, if you have any final questions, um, you can put that into the chat. Uh, but we are gonna wrap up uh, today's event. So before doing that, I would actually, um, like to thank everyone here uh, for all your hard work to put this together. Um, Emmanuel, in case you have anything for um, an, an additional Elven plug, uh, feel free to share that with us. But to start with, I guess I will um, have a plug for uh, UCR Astronomy. So for those uh, who haven't really uh, known us for a while, um, you can uh, join us. Uh, on uh, the, the UCR uh, Facebook page. So you can either follow us or like us there. And as you can see here, um, all our events will be posted as soon as they are scheduled. So our next event is actually gonna be the regular um, virtual stargazing that we have been having for a while. Um, and that's gonna be on the April Fool astronomy because it's next Thursday on April the 1st. And for this one, we'll be talking about some common uh, myths, uh, misconceptions, and also misnomers, um, current days, and also throughout the uh, history in astronomy. So how, how people um, got over those misconceptions, or sometimes they still remain even in present day. And we will uh, learn that in the context of um, stargazing. So uh, if you haven't yet, uh, sign up for that and we can see you again on Thursday. Great. And I'll just say um, there's a couple other things. Um, NASA.gov slash sun is uh, uh, more info about the sun. Um, and then a great website is called thesuntoday.org. And that has a lot of great news about the sun and, and uh, people's photos. And you can follow uh, NASA's uh, heliophysics and uh, solar research group uh, on Facebook at, at NASA Sun Science or on Twitter at NASA Sun. 
And um, you can also find the Elfin team on Facebook. Just look up UCLA Elfin. And yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in and hope you learned something about the sun and are more curious about space weather. Thanks, Emmanuel. And I also wanted to mention that um, the, the links that we put out to in our uh, presentation slides and also for UCR Astronomy, as well as for um, the um, UCR Astronomy and UCLA Alpen, those can all be found in the video description if you just click the down pointing arrow. So the links are already there. Um, great, so I would like to thank everyone for joining us again. Um, I hope you learned something very exciting about the sun, which is you know, the closest star to us. Um, as mentioned earlier, we would really appreciate your feedback on, on our event. And you would also have a chance to sign up for our mailing list in the same survey if you want to be informed of all our future events. Um, so uh, the survey will be completely anonymous and it will be sent to you uh, again via um, Eventbrite. So uh, I guess that's it. Well, thanks again for joining us and uh, we hope you have a great rest of the weekend. Yes, take care. All right, bye.